hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to Lombardi Time Brews Live. I'm your host, John. That is Claudia. <laughs> she is actually joining us here today. She had nothing else going on. An unexpected off day for her. So I uh, decided to hop on the show and uh, check in with all of you fine folks, see how all of you are doing, see what questions you got about the draft and everything else coming up. Hello to you, Janelle. Hi, nice Janelle. to see you here. So before I figured there would be some questions or anything like that, I do have just a couple little nuggets of info for you. Um, first, I'm going to recap what the Packers' top 30 visits have been thus far. I believe we're up to having 10 top visits announced through various media outlets or the players themselves as they post pictures to Instagram of them at Lambeau kind of telling. So again, and I should say too, I know other people are really on this lately, but the term top 30 visits does not necessarily mean that the Packers are looking at choosing this player in the top 30 of the draft. It's just, they get rights to bring in 30 guys to retest, interview, et cetera, et cetera. And that's what this list really is. So I'm going to rattle off the names here up to 10, as we know right now, one would be Omar Brown, the safety out of Nebraska, who does have corner experience as well. Uh, that one was just announced earlier today, actually. Another one would be Jerrion Jones, cornerback from Florida State, a corner with some inside outside versatility, perhaps known best for his man coverage, uh, as well as a very, very high Raz. I just double checked that I believe it was 9.6. Another one would be Michael Hall Jr., the defensive lineman from Ohio State. A little bit of a tweener, uh, started out the draft process at about 280 pounds, now looks to be about 290 pounds. So he's been eating out a lot lately as well as working out, uh, trying to find a spot on the D-line, but the Packers certainly like his level of explosion, you got to believe. Another one would be fan favorite, Edgerin Cooper, linebacker from Texas A&M. Uh, we talked about Cooper a bunch, right? Disruption is his middle name. I know a lot of people were over the moon when it was announced the Packers were bringing him in for a top 30 visit. So the interest there, the rumors, it's real. Uh, next, we have Zach Zinter, an interior offensive lineman from the University of Michigan. Not a whole lot to say here. He's a very, very experienced player, someone that could make a lot of sense, perhaps in day two for Green Bay if they're looking interior offensive line. Another one, Christian Boyd, defensive lineman from Northern Iowa, tested particularly well. And even at his pro day, he was asked about, hey, what's the Packers level of interest in you? And he went, uh, the Packers basically just ran my pro day. So you got to believe there's at least a little bit of interest there since they also brought him in for a visit. Another one would be Trevin Wallace, linebacker from Kentucky. Looks right now to be about a day three selection, another ultra aggressive linebacker. Uh, certainly someone who could make sense, another very athletic player as well. Another Jaquan Shepard, cornerback from Maryland. This one reported by Tony Pauline. Haven't seen it many other places. Uh, Shepard, not nearly as athletic as other corners that they're looking at, probably would be a day three pick. And then someone potentially for round one, they actually brought him in, Tyler Guyton, the big tackle from Oklahoma. Some pundits believe maybe he's a little bit too big for how Green Bay generally likes their tackles. They also doesn't have a lot of versatility or experience. But nonetheless, Packers may have some real interest there as they did bring him in for a top 30 visit. And then the last one that I'm going to rattle off right now, one of... My favorites that I've been talking about for weeks would be Keaton Oladapo. Yes, the safety from Oregon State. They just brought him in for a visit. Uh, he's a very aggressive safety, perhaps too aggressive by some NFL standards, but a really, really fun player to watch. He's been getting a ton of buzz. I know other Packer people are now on him now and saying, well, he could move up to day two. I don't know. PFF still pretty has him pretty squarely in day three, but you know what? Whoever takes him, I think, is going to wind up with a very fun safety project. So those are the players that ultimately are the top 30 visits for the Packers that we know of right now. As you can tell, two safeties, both of them being box safeties or projected to be at least so. Packers certainly have their eye in a certain direction there. Uh, two corners, two defensive linemen. Two linebackers, one interior offensive lineman, and one tackle. That's the spread right now, and certainly Packers seeming to be uh, hitting their top 30 visits with positions of need 
that we know about. So uh, one last tidbit here. Apparently, they also held a virtual visit. Didn't really count as a top 30, but they were able to chat with the other Maryland corner, Tarheeb Still. So take that for what it's worth. And then the last thing before I turn, some over, turn it over to some questions, I just wanted to bring this in in case you're trying to figure out what the Packers might do in round one. Now, this is not an end-all be-all, but it is kind of relevant to how the Packers operate. And there are some anomalies here And well. The last time the Packers picked following position in the first round, here's just a little bit of background for you. Of course, Edge was taken in 2023 with LVN. Interior defensive lineman and inside linebacker, both frankly surprising picks, but Devontae Wyatt and Quay Walker. Cornerback 2021, Eric Stokes. Quarterback 2020, the man, Jordan Love. 2019 would be their last safety chosen in the first round, Darnell Savage. And then you've got a gap for some of these other positions. One would be offensive tackle, Derek Sherrod in 2011. Wide receiver, go back even farther in time, 2002, Javon Walker. Tight end, 2000, with Bubba, Bubba Franks. And then if you're looking for the last time that the Packers chose an interior offensive lineman in the draft, there's a little bit of discrepancy here with how you want to characterize players, but either 1994 or 1997, 94 being Aaron Taylor, 97 being Ross Verba, who was drafted as a tackle but wound up playing guard. That's kind of the discrepancy. But nonetheless, interior O-line, you're going back to the mid-90s and then running back. 1987 with Brent Fullwood. So it's been some time, y'all, uh, since the Packers addressed any of those positions in round one. So, all right. Hope everybody out there is doing well. Let me know if you got any questions. It's time for me to get a drink of water and for her to read some questions. All righty. So we got Chris Hand saying, get some pencil and paper out. Let's get to drafting. Absolutely. Time's coming, Chris. Patrice, hello, and go pet go. Hello, Patrice. Hello, Patrice. Prince Capsaicin says, good afternoon. Hello. Janelle saying, Packers defense needs more aggression. Yeah, yeah. And there's some guys on that top 30 list that would do it. I mean, uh, Oladapo would certainly do it. Omar Brown, in a different way, would bring aggression as well. Even Jerry and Jones is a very um, handsy corner. Uh, so they do seem to be thinking along the same lines as you, Janelle. Uh, then we got Captain Kebbles saying Return of the King. He's been promoted to captain. <laughs> Hello, my friend. Hello. And McKnight saying, how about select a wide receiver at 25? Trade Dobbs to Bills for a second round pick. <laughs> okay, Mick, your wheels are turning. Um, so the thing is, uh, I'm a little hesitant. I've seen all the chatter today about like, well, Bills suddenly have a need. Let's just move Romeo. I'm a little hesitant to do that one just because Romeo seemingly is like their most consistent of the wide receivers. I know an argument could certainly be made for Jaden Reed as well, but, um, and I do think even as well as Romeo's produced with two years left in his contract, I think a second round pick may be a bit rich for Romeo Dobbs. Um, in terms of choosing a wide receiver at 25, I'm not going to rule it out. There are some that make sense. This is a incredibly good wide receiver class. It's being considered one of the best ever. So at pick 25, maybe you're looking at like Lad McConkey out of uh, out of Georgia. Maybe you're looking at uh, even Brian Thomas from LSU. So there are some guys there that can make some sense. Some more Packersy than others. Um, one guy that I have a lot of difficulty, I know he's been talked about with a lot of Packer different things, but his route running scares the bejesus out of me. I got to say, I don't necessarily love Keon Coleman for the Packers. Not that he'd be in the convo at 25 anyway, but just throwing it out there. Uh, one round two guy that I actually like, even though he's a bit older than they may entertain to be Xavier Leggett. I think his development in year five collegiately, yes, he's a little old. I fully acknowledge that, but I think he would be a very, very fun project who's shown this last year that he does have the route running prowess. That would make some sense for Green Bay as well as the contested catchability, even though he didn't do it as much as others believe. All right, then we got Martin Blom saying, hi hey guys, nice to see you. Nice to see you too, Martin. How can we approve special teams? <laughs> well, if anyone's got the answer, they might make a bunch of money. Um, my approach to this, at step one, 
if you really want to get into the nitty gritty here, my approach to this step one would be draft players who are better tacklers. And they kind of started to in the last couple of years, but they also have this tendency, especially with their day three picks, to gamble a little bit more as they kind of should. But ultimately, too, with guys who are more inconsistent in their tackling. Um, even in round one, they've done that before. Look at Darnell Savage in 2019. But still, that's a number one is you want to improve special teams, bring in guys who can tackle better. Number two, I think that they should take a critical look at their personnel usage across the board. I've been very on top of the fact that Rich Bisaccia always has a tight end in the top three of his special team snaps year in, year out, without question. Okay, And I, I very much get that. But at the same time, we've seen tight ends as the most outside person on field goal blocking get burned. Or I, th I think it was Tyler Davis in preseason. I'm failing. My memory's letting me go. But like there was a tight end last year. Maybe it was Deguara who like stood up from his blocking as Anders was attempting a field goal. And both guys that he was responsible for, he didn't hit either one. And they just ran right past him. Well, I understand it's typical to have a tight end there, but if they can't block, maybe use Caleb Jones in a game and have him do it, or maybe just switch around the personnel group. So anyway, I don't have all the answers in that regard, but I would seriously look at how the Packers are using their personnel in those spots. Then you might begin to see some progress. Until then, though, probably not. Might you want to get a different kicker too? Yeah, maybe, because I don't think Greg Joseph is anything you know, worthwhile and like a dramatic upgrade over what Carlson did last year. Maybe he's a touch more consistent, but I don't know. It's even though go that far. So yeah, that's kind of the top of mind steps that I would take there. Captain Kevill saying, I nominated myself mostly because people kept thinking I was French and it now matches my game picks. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> what are your thoughts on the chances that for this year, Green Bay goes with more of a hybrid base. I know that base is really nickel now, but I can't imagine the chance to have five men on the line rushing the passer mm -hmm. is fully gone, especially when we only have two real IVs. Yeah, I think it's incredibly possible. You know, we talked a lot as they were searching for a defensive coordinator about, boy, wouldn't it be nice if we could get Mike McDonald, who of course went on to be Seattle's head coach, or, you know, one of his disciples like Zachary Orr, Chris Hewitt, all these Baltimore guys, right? And part of the reason that a lot of people wanted them is because the Baltimore defense is incredibly multiple. When you look at what formation they line up in, it's it's incredibly scattered compared to other teams in the league. And I do have to believe that given what Halfley has done in the past, yes, like base-wise, you could he's 4-3 in terms of philosophy. And then truly what he uses the most, yeah, like you acknowledge, it's nickel, most of the time being 4-2-5. I do think this year we're going to see some 5-2 type arrangements, maybe even some of the uh, old school 4-6 style arrangements with uh, getting a couple of the edge rushers to stand back up like they've been doing for years. So to your point, yeah, I think it's going to be incredibly multiple. We'll probably still see nickel the most out of anything. We will still see a good mix of 4-3 in there. Maybe a little bit more than 20% of the time, which is the golden rule. But um, to your point, yeah, I absolutely see 5-2 wrinkles coming, and it matches their personnel better, too. I agree. All right. So we got McKnight saying, name the offensive lineman on the team today who will be with the Packers on opening day. Nick, you and the O-line. Okay. Um... Can't say they're back to you anywhere. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's go with the starters, right? Rasheed Walker, guaranteed. Uh, Elton Jenkins, uh, Josh Myers, Sean Ryan, he's still a guarantee, even though he might not start. And then uh, right tackle, we got Zach Tom. Okay, so there you got five. Moving on from that, I do not think that Royce Newman is any type of guarantee to make the roster, especially considering that his cap number is up and over $3 million, the fifth highest cap hit of any offensive player on the Packers. So I don't think he's a guarantee, 
what he has going for him is his experience and the fact that he basically is the only interior offensive lineman depth that's still on the roster. That might save his job. Um, beyond that, though, I think Caleb Jones is on the Yash Nyman route. He's been kind of practice squad to 53 to never being elevated to then potentially being a real part of the 53. That's the exact trajectory Yash Nyman followed as their last project tackle. So I would think if he's improved at all, Caleb Jones is going to be next to step into that role. Luke Tenuta, it might very well come down to his health. I know he returned at the end of the year, but this is not the first year he's had some chronic type injuries going on. We'll have to see with him. But really at this point, I think you're looking at six guaranteed linemen. Maybe Kadeem Telford, if he got a little bit more mobile, might wake his way onto the roster. They were very high on him. So we're looking at six guaranteed linemen as of right now. And then a bunch of question marks for now. I do expect them to take two or three offensive linemen in this draft for sure. And I also wouldn't be shocked if one more vet post-draft happens to find their way into Green Bay. Perhaps someone in the form of like a Dalton Rissner or a tackle if they don't get a swing tackle in the draft. Patrice is wondering who's going to, to step in to help block for J-Lo. Hey, I kind of just rolled it out there, didn't I, Patrice? I mean... Uh, that's what they got right now. Now, supposedly they are interested in Tyler Guyton. He would probably have to be their first round pick in the draft. Everyone and their mother even has connected them to Graham Barton. Uh, I'm a lot lower on that than a lot of other people, just because I view Graham Barton as an interior offensive lineman. I, I think the Packers are going to view him as such as well, which realistically they'd have to, like I said, go against a pretty strong tendency since 1997 to pick an interior offensive lineman in the first round. Is it possible? 100%. And guards are getting paid more than they've ever gotten paid. So maybe they are becoming a premium position, but still would be unpackersy to do so. But uh, they, they got their starters right now, at least, with a big old question mark on Sean Ryan. All righty. See, Jeff saying, seems needs are considered to be safety, corner, interior linebacker, offensive tackle, heroes <laughs> on the line running back what would you rank of importance be yeah i mean you hit it on the head right <laughs> the whole list yeah uh, so okay i'm gonna put my list is probably a little different than a lot of others but frankly in my opinion i would probably put box safety as the overall number one need doesn't mean they're gonna address it first in the draft but that's my number one need just because if i look at the roster they literally don't have anyone in that spot right now like they've got Anthony Johnson Jr., but he's going to be more of the post-safety spot. They've got Xavier McKinney, who realistically they signed to be their post-safety. And then, yeah, they've got Benny Sapp, same thing. Maybe he could play some box, although he's a little small for it. But, you know, so I'm looking at that and I'm saying there's literally no one. So let's go with that first. Then I'm going to do the exact same thing at inside linebacker, where they have one starter, maybe two with McDuffie, and then Maybe their third as of right now is Eric Wilson, and then Welch is their only backup. So, yeah, that's got to get addressed. They don't have enough bodies. Uh, those would be my clear-cut top two, just because as of right now, they can't play a game with the way that they have it set. Then I'm going to go with interior offensive line and corner, because there you've got starters, but they're riddled with question marks. Eric Stokes, what's his health? Interior offensive line, Sean Ryan, what's his ceiling? I don't think we know yet. So there you go. Um, and yes, Valentine's going to play some corner as well, but still, you want more than two. Um, and then let's go with theater, third tier being tackle and running back, just because they definitely have their starters there. And realistically, they're looking for upgrades or depth. So we'll put those in tier three. All right. Rocket Knees saying, go triple or doubles down on a certain position in the draft, like wide receiver and tight end. Mm -hmm. What position would you like Goot to try this year? Is O-line strong in this draft? Yeah. Uh, so to answer the O-line question first, yes, unequivocally so, actually. It's by many like draft insiders considered probably the strongest position rounds one through seven in this draft, which is why if you've checked out my mocks or even my mocked kind of breakdowns, I honestly prefer them not to take an O-lineman in round one because I'm not sure that like the level of value, if you take a round one O-lineman versus a round two, three, four O-lineman, 
not sure that the gap between those two is as great as it is at a a position like cornerback or safety. So go get those positions first and then get the O-lineman. That's basically my reasoning there. But it is a very, very strong O-line draft, both for tackles and interior offensive line. The weakest of the bunch is probably center. Um, In terms of where he's going to double and triple down, (laughs) O-line. I think that that's like the easy answer. Perhaps if he falls in love with a couple candidates, safety. But I think the clear cut, like we're going to see two, three offensive linemen, it's O-line. Definitely. Kevin Kevill saying, hat take. I was more upset with Green Bay that they think David is finished and cut him when I than I was when Jones left, mostly because I knew Jones was going to be fine. Ooh. I don't want to talk about them. Like, <laughs> I mean, that is a hot take. I don't, uh, you know, I was very much on the Bakhtiari train of like, work out a pay cut. Bring him back. Do what Tyron Smith did in Dallas last year to, to keep that last year of his contract because then you solve your offensive line problem for one more year at least at the tackle spot. But when I heard that he's not even going to be remotely ready to start doing anything until training camp again this year, yeah, okay, that that's a pretty decent nail in that coffin. And it's not to say he can't come back and play great. He wants to. I, I don't doubt him. But it makes a lot of sense for the Packers to be like, yeah, we cannot afford to do this again. Jonesy leaving, on the other hand, yeah, it just stung because I think it was so unexpected. Like Bakhtiari, I was holding out, hoping he'd be back, but like it just it it was logical for it not to happen. Jones was like, oh crap, they're really doing this. Goodbye, old friend. And we had that like 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah, we of, did. Like, we have Josh Jacobs and we have Aaron Jones. <laughs> this is going to be dream team, baby. We are going to be so good. And then that was quickly killed. Yeah, I'm not going to lie to you. Like, I texted my family and I was like, we have the best running back room in the league. And then, and then we didn't. I and mean, it stung. That's That was the whiplash on that one for sure. Patrice saying, what do you think about the NFL rules changes? I think the kickoff thing is actually a really nice compromise. It's going to lead to more excitement than what we've seen in the last couple of years. So I'm on board. Uh, In terms of the hip drop thing, I think that that's being like overblown by a lot. I really do. I've seen so many sports accounts share clips of like, this is a hip drop tackle now. They're ruining the NFL. And then what they share like isn't even what the rules say is a hip drop tackle. So I think, is it going to be annoying at times because refs are inevitably going to screw it up? Yep, for sure. I think that's going to be, it's the the officiating of the new rule is going to be what really tells whether this is going to be a pain or just fine. For sure. And it's going to happen sometimes. But I don't think it's this cataclysmic thing that's going to ruin games and become a permanent part of, of the viewing experience now. I think it's just, I think a lot of people are overblown in my opinion. Kevin Kevill saying Packers baited us into buying all those 33 jerseys, feeling secure in order to pay for that J-Love cash bonus. You, you dog. I'm not going to lie what? to you, man. I almost did yeah. buy one, too. Yeah, you did. And I bought an Aaron Jones bobblehead the week before. So I feel you. Yeah, I almost. <laughs> I was like this close to buying a retro throwback yeah, Aaron right? Jones. And I still might. I don't care. If they go on clearance, <laughs> I don't care. I will wear they a 33. I'll go be one at the tent sale. Okay, so. By the way, tent sale Friday and Saturday this week. If you live anywhere near Green Bay, I'll probably be there Friday afternoon. Just heads up. Martin saying, scary thought. What if Jalen takes a step back in his development? You know, it's possible. It And I've thought about this a lot too. And, and uh, one month from today, he might be locking into a very, very lucrative contract. It's possible. Certainly. And we do have to acknowledge that. But I think what's encouraging is that you look over the last half of the year when he did experience all of the success. And a lot of the traits that he showed were not traits that you sit back and go, oh, that was really lucky. You know, because even earlier in the year, what were we saying? Like the chemistry is all off. The timing is off. But they're this close to getting it right. And then all of a sudden it just clicked. And and all of a sudden the offense took off. Right. So I think. Even like, yeah, there were some uh, ball placement issues earlier in the year that did get corrected. My concern, as it is with any uh, franchise quarterback, is, as we saw with his predecessor, 
what happens over the years, not next year, but like well into the future. Mm -hmm. Do they put more and more of the team on their back and then wind up forcing things like we saw in the early 2000s with a different quarterback? Or, you know what I mean? That's the concern. And if he starts doing that, which Jordan Love does have a little bit of gunslinger in him, he's certainly willing to make more risky throws than Rodgers ever was. Then we might see a step back. But I don't know. The traits that he showed at the back end of this year were not traits that I'm looking at and saying, mm, a lot of that's luck. He's going to fall off. No, like they, they, the foundation is set and now it looks like he's ascending, not declining. Kevin Kevin's saying, I definitely think there will be games where he's stumped. All quarterbacks have meltdown games. Yep. Yep. Especially as defenses continue to adapt to what the Packers are doing offensively. Right. I mean, that's just, that's a given. We know it's going to happen for sure. McKnight saying, which Packer drafted in 2024 will be a bobblehead you will be trading in 2024? Oh, okay. All right. All right. Uh, which Packer drafted in 2024 will be a bobblehead in 2034? Um, oh, Mick, I really like that. So you're asking me for a draft prediction and someone I'm going to fall in love with? That's brutal, man. Um, I mean, like, my biggest crush is like, I guess I'd have to go with Cooper to Gene just because there's I, don't, don't you quote this anywhere. Okay. It's just between us friends, but like his disruption, his playmaking, not his athletic traits. Don't get me wrong, but they're a little reminiscent of what he can do in a good defense. than when we saw Charles Woodson switch to safety, don't quote that. Don't put it out there just between us. Okay. But like I there's some traits and I think a lot of people could fall in love with that certainly. Uh right. Miserable goat saying long time. Nevertheless, are Man. you ready for love to an MVP if we have a one <laughs> an ounce of defense? An ounce of defense. <laughs> Which we we should. We should this year. Uh hey, I'm all for it. Uh, last I checked, love was seventh in the MVP odds this coming year. Oh pff. yeah, yeah. Throw some money down on that. I'm not telling you what to do with your money. This is not financial advice. Again, do not yeah, tweet this. Do not put it out there. But yeah, no, that's feels good. See the little fine print under there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh boy, McKnight saying, Claudia, as you broadcast games this year, whose name will you say more often because they've earned more times <laughs> this year? Must have been on the 2023 roster. Um, I'm going to say. Tucker Craft. <coughs> oh, there you go. Because he really started to get his footing. I say that as I'm thinking about Luke Musgrave. <laughs> <laughs> but um, when Musgrave was out, he really got to shine a little bit more. And um, so I think he will be one that will get a little bit more action. And hopefully Luke Musgrave, too, can stay on his feet. I like that. I like that a lot. <clears throat> Mick, I know you didn't ask me, but I would say Kevin Valentine. Just throwing it out there. My question. <laughs> I jacking my question. That was last. Kevin Kevels saying, <clears throat> I actually think this is Rich's last year, but he is hired as a head coach somewhere to do special teams rules changing. He looks brilliant on returns anyway. Stopping the opposing team? We'll see. <laughs> it's possible. I mean, he had an interview last year, uh, I think, with the Colts. Um, and he's like, I mean, like whether he's the best special teams coordinator in the world or not, which I think we can acknowledge by not, he's one heck of a locker room leader. I mean, even now Packers still, whenever they're asked about him speak glowingly. And that's after they had another down special teams year. They weren't talking about like that with Mo Drayton. So, um, it's, it's possible. I, I'm not with the thought that it could be Rich's last year because the special teams isn't great. And then Matt lets go of him. I think they're too close. I think Matt values his leadership too much. Mm -hmm. This isn't like Joe Barry. So yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm with you. Rocket and he's saying love is only 25. He will grow as a player and mm -hmm. more importantly, mature as a man. Certainly. I heard all of his interviews. He comes off pretty decent, not as articulate as Rogers. Maybe I'm being unfair. I think a lot of that is, is youth. And I would also say, cause I, I watched a couple interviews. I haven't gotten to watch all of them yet. Um, cause he's, he's certainly been making his way on media row lately, hasn't he? Um, 
but I think you know Rogers is is not a typical human in that regard. Rogers is an incredibly articulate human being, and he always has been. Now, granted, you may not agree with what comes out of his mouth these days, but he still is a good speaker, right? Mm -hmm. And that goes all the way back to him uh, being rookie year in Green Bay. He had a skill of knowing the right thing to say and when to say it. He's basically featured, uh, even when he was a rookie second-year player, talking about the Packers' history and naming dudes from the 50s and 60s. He's a student of the game. He's articulate. You know, Jordan Love is, yes, younger than the Rodgers we've seen in the last few years, but also, I think, just younger in his persona. And I'm not trying to be unfair. I think it's just the reality of it. He's coming up with a much, much younger team than Rodgers did. They, uh, I use the phrase a lot of, like, immaculate vibes. Like, they're just a very, very youthful bunch. And that's great. And Jordan Love, to his credit, is still a very, very articulate human who says what he means to say. Maybe just not as elegantly as his predecessor, but that I think, I think you're spot on, Rockinese. I think that'll come with time. As we'll go and saying, stay healthy and stay safe. Back to spraying this car for me. Thank you, man. You Have as well. Fun. <laughs> Kevin Kevin saying, I truly think this will be the season Watson plays 14 plus games. Is it legit one of the best fighters he was playing right now? When he was fighting for the ball last year, he was uncoverable and save, saved from the Friends <laughs> Fantasy League. Yeah. Keyword, when he was fighting. Yeah. Uh, you know, if he can put together a 14-game season or more, yeah, the conversation about him radically changes completely. Um, and the thing is, even in the limited time, like when he was really healthy this year, we're talking only like two, three games that that was truly the case. Those are the games that he put up like 100 yards. Those are the games that he looked unstoppable. And then it went away again. So it is not an ability issue with him. It is not. They're not going to use him because he's on the field and healthy. They're using him a lot. It's a matter of is that man healthy? And yeah, I'm in full agreement. If he does it, he'll be great. Kevin Kevin saying, if you saw a bet that LVN is second most in pressures and takes defensive end edge Smith spot by week eight. Hmm. I would. I don't like it. I don't like it. I don't feel confident in it, but I'm going to say I'm not going to take it. I wouldn't. I think uh, as even Mel Kuyper noted, like LVN has all the tools, but he's not a double digit sack machine. Um, I do like LVN a lot. He did get a lot more pressures than, than you think of based upon just watching his rookie year. But I still think this year, much like Rashawn Gary was uh, in his development, he's still number three. I think maybe come playoff time, we start seeing him more. But Preston Smith didn't even fall off last year. He still put together a great year. Everyone was expecting him to drop off. He really didn't. Now when you look at the numbers, at least. Uh, another near double-digit sack season for Preston Smith, and he's still going strong. So uh, I think LVN sticks into his number three rotational role for now, and Preston just, just edges it out, but it's getting close. Patrice asks, do you think that Tyler Davis is going to ball out next year, or next this year, since he tore in his ACL last year? Ball out? No, because I think he's going to find himself pretty far down on the depth chart. But I also think, though, that like coming into this year, the Packers had a pretty definite role for him in mind. Plus, he was the special team snap leader the year prior. If he sticks on the roster, I think he's going to go right back to being highly ranked on special teams. And then they'll have a role in mind for him. The question is, are they going to shift him to H-back like DeGuara used to fill? Or is he going to become the number three, the true number three tight end and take over for Ben Sims if they elect to move on from Sims? So a lot to be determined there. But do I mention a massive breakout? No. I don't see that one coming, Patrice. Mick saying that once. Did I mention John? It's my show, Mick. Just had to jump in. <laughs> Sad Ink says, I don't know if you saw the post by Tay Wicks' personal coach, but he said Wicks is getting ready to take over, and I believe him. Yeah. I love Wicks, and I think he was a steal in the draft last year. Oh, I agree 1,000%. Yeah, and uh, I did see that post. <laughs> it's, it's, 
it was good to see, right? Like it was one of those like, all right, let's just get this season because I'm ready. Uh, Wicks has so much more ability than than his draft spot allowed him. The Packers truly benefited from all of the changes that he underwent uh, in his last year of college because he had, I think it was a new quarterback, a new offensive system, and like his production just tanked. But his junior year, he had like a 1,400-yard year. And he, like the traits were always there. Lucky for us, the Packers acknowledged them and pick him. I know CBS did a, a redraft of last year recently, and the Packers wound up with three selections in the first round in that redraft. Gontavian Wicks, I believe, is one of them. So uh, the future is very, very bright for Wicks, no doubt. Uh, Kevin Kevill saying, which two wide receivers do you have right now? Do you think Russ is eyeballing for, or got them up for sure, guys? Dobbs and Reed. Right now, Dobbs and Reed. I don't know what. I'm not quite sure that Kevils. <laughs> Let me know what you mean by that one. Uh, LVN seems to handle the massive bodies flowing his way better than Gary does. Yeah. Uh, who seems best when he is lone one-on-one -on -one with guys? Smith and Van Ness seem to be able to get hands on guys when engaged. Yeah, I think that's the thing, right? Like LVN is uh, athletically more Rashawn Gary. In play, probably a little bit more Preston Smith, a little bit more strong side, whereas Gary is... Like he really excels, like you mentioned in those one on one. Just let his athleticism win. Don't give him a lot to do. Just tell him to go get the quarterback. Whereas Preston can set a better edge. LVN can as well. Um, so that's why I think, like in terms of play and what they do to this point in LVN's career, a, a better comparison is Smith than Gary for sure. Big Al saying, hi, John, do you think Packers might add more free agents, maybe Micah Hyde or any free agents that can't find a team? Yeah, I do. In fact, uh, Friday's show is going to be on who are guys who are still out there as free agents who could be last second signings before the draft to plug a couple holes. Brian Gutekunst, uh, about, uh, I haven't finished my research on this, so forgive me if it's a little off, but basically like 40% of the years he's been GM, he's made some kind of April signing to plug a hole. The one year with Sammy Watkins, yes, that went terribly, but he still did it. Uh, so uh, we're going to take a look at that. Micah Hyde, he, maybe. Justin Simmons, eh, maybe. Um you know, but I think a more likely addition might come on the offensive line than it would at safety. Brian Goodkins did mention that he wants to go young at safety. So, uh, Big Al, possible? Yeah, I, I really think it is. We got to keep being the youngest team. Can't change the average too much. Well, yeah, exactly. Commando, do you, hey, what Commando. position do you think needs to have most improvements this year to make sure the team gets better and not progress? I'm going to go with safety. And Xavier McKinney should take care of a lot of that. And Rudy Ford did some really admirable things last year before getting hurt. Um, Darnell Savage was Darnell Savage, slightly more consistent than he had been historically. But if the Packers can put together a really strong safety room, then all of a sudden that defense is going to start looking a lot better than it has. So I'm, I'm going to say safety. Kevin Kevill saying, since 2020, Green Bay has shifted more and more to running between the tackles than outside zone or stretch. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the reason? I used to think it was because Bach was out, but it seems to be, do you continue on? Oh. A purposeful change and shift, especially the increase of duo. Many, even non-Green Bay fans have noticed it is yeah. very different than Matt's fellow West Coast play callers. Yes, and that's a definitive trend, right? Especially the last two years, the numbers have really began to change. Um, as for the reason, honestly, I've done a lot of thinking about this and I'm not quite sure. Um, yeah, you could make the argument that they just really want to run behind Elton Jenkins, which is like, okay, sure. But next to him is Josh Myers, who's way better in pass pro than he is in run. And you can't convince me that they've been purposely running behind John Runyon Jr. and Sean Ryan. So like, eh. but I'm going to be real honest here, like Hevels and I don't know why. The only thing that I can think of, and Aaron Jones does not jive with this, is the Packers have shown a real tendency as of late to like bigger backs. Brian Goodekun seems to want running backs who are like 220 pounds, not under two like Aaron Jones was. Josh Jacobs, way more of a bowling ball than Aaron Jones was. They retained A.J. Dillon on a really, really good contract. 
maybe it's just going with that. But to be totally honest, I don't know why he's doing this, but uh, we just got to hope it works. Prince Capsis and saying, looks like there could be four quarterbacks going in the top five. Mm -hmm. How many do you think will be gone by pick 25? Um, well, let's see. I mean, it's, uh, I haven't, uh, thought about it that way. So let's go Caleb Williams, obviously Drake may obviously Jaden Daniels definitely going to happen. Um, and then you've got JJ McCarthy, who everyone is talking about, like it's definitely going to happen. Um, and then the next tier you got, I feel like you're right in that four, four feels really confident. Like just darn near guarantee. We're going to see four before 25. So let's just go with the surprise and let's sneak in a fifth. Maybe Bo Nix, maybe uh, maybe Michael Penix like, completely ascends up draft boards. He did have a very, very strong workout recently. Um, so let's let's just go with let's go with five to answer your question, Chris. All right, Rack and he's saying I think two years from now, Wicks and Reed will be the one and two wide receivers. Dobbs and Watson will not be on the team. Just my prediction. Um I can see them moving on from Dobbs, even though I said he was the most consistent earlier. Like he's probably i hate to even say it this way but he's probably the the least unique of the bunch so they could move on from him watson it's it, are they fixing his hamstring or not because if they fix the hamstring he's not going anywhere in fact he's going to get mega paid in a couple of years um if the hamstring problems persist yeah then then i could be with you completely chad ing saying hey, by the way, great to have you back, John. Glad you're feeling better. Thanks, Who's Chad. your co-host? Who's your co-host? Hey, this is Claudia. <laughs> um, yes, she is my partner on the pod, partner in life. Chad, I know you're a little bit new around here, but she does all of the watch parties with me. And then probably also a bunch of Wednesdays moving forward. We've also had talks about starting her own little offshoot show. So uh, maybe be on the lookout for that. So I'm a little bit different for maybe. the channel. <laughs> Very, very early in development. Maybe, this maybe, is, maybe. This is a conversation over wine. Don't take I us don't at... I don't want to be seeing your comments because I see your comments on the videos. <laughs> I don't want to be seeing a bunch of comments going, where's Chloe? Where's Chloe? Now. Yeah, right. Very, very early development. But anyway, yes. Partner in life, partner in pod, Claudia. All right. Uh, Kevin Kevin saying, my bad, guys. Dogs jump me. Well, it's okay. I was asking which two wide receivers do you think Russ and Goot deem essential to extend right now of mm. Out of the last two draft classes, mine are Dobbs and Reed. Sir, sure, so for like in terms of extensions, uh, Reed certainly. Uh, and then let's just say that they get the hamstring good, then Watson. If the hamstring problems persist, then I think we're probably looking at Wicks. I just, I can't get there quite. I like Dobbs a lot, but I do think he's, you know, a little... Uh, a little more replaceable than the others. So, all right. Uh, Big Al saying, do you agree that Braylon Allen seems like another AJ Dillon, in my opinion, but would be nice since he's from Wisconsin? Yeah, I think I'm anytime they pick a Badger, it's it's just nice, right? Um, in terms of being another AJ Dillon, the size aspect is certainly there. Um, trying to think i'm i'm gonna comp him to dylan's collegiate profile from what i remember and like yeah there are similarities both bigger backs both known for breaking tackles both having some deceptive quick titch, uh, twitch in close range um i would just say i'd be very surprised if they actually went through with choosing allen yeah he's the youngest player in the draft in that regard they totally could pick him uh that meshes very very well um but that would be thunder, thunder, thunder at running back for the foreseeable future. And that's a lot of meat behind the line. Generally, historically, even though they like bigger backs, they at least have one wrinkle of a little bit smaller or let's say speedier guy. And Braylon Allen not doing all of the running in his pre-draft prep is pretty concerning. And I think the Packers are going to red flag that pretty hard. McKnight saying, can Anthony Johnson Jr. earn 250 defensive snaps this year? Earn? Yeah, certainly. Uh, is he in line for it right now? Uh, there's a lot of ways to go before that because uh, I think they're going to be adding multiple bodies there. And I still want him to re-sign Rudy. Right? Um, and that's coming from the dude who's got a crush on Anthony Johnson Jr. 
My question with Anthony Johnson Jr. is might they entertain a move back to corner for him? Just kind of thinking out loud here. He was a corner in college for four years. Uh, it's where he did a lot of his best work collegiately before switching to center or a safety. I just wonder if uh, if it's something they might be looking at to help shore up depth at corner if they completely load up the safety position with other people and even vet signings. All right, a couple more, then we got to jump. And my voice is giving away. Janelle's a funny option show. I love it. Thank you, Janelle. I see how it is, Janelle. <laughs> Kevin Pebble says, I'm not afraid of Williams on the Bears at all. That team is too frantic and incompetent on different levels that the fans even know Mahomes would have failed there. Yeah, I'll tell you, the only thing I'm really worried about is like they are stacking the deck for him pretty strongly. I mean, running back, I'm not really afraid of any of their running backs uh, between, you know, their new signing DeAndre Swift and and uh, Khalil Herbert. And like, eh, they're all just kind of like, eh, I'm not really afraid of any. But their wide receiver crew, I mean, DJ Moore is good, good. And sure, like Jay Earl shut him down. But Keenan Allen on the other side, that's legit. Um Keenan Allen's the dude who does not show many signs of slowing down. And his like his game is one that will age incredibly well into his mid thirties being a route running specialist. So, uh, yeah. and Komet's fine at tight end. So, I mean, like, am I afraid of the bears? No, but I do think they're not being as dumb as they've been. And that's a little concerning. Uh, Kevin Cabell saying, crazy, the one time Goody wanted a wide receiver in the first, the NFL said, no, you wait for round two. <laughs> <That's so true. laughs> what he's tried is so hard. Like, we've we've heard the rumors about, like, well, he wanted Jefferson, and then Jefferson was taken. Well, he wanted Brandon Bayuk, and then Brandon Bayuk was taken. Like, it's just, we've heard this for years. And then, like, I'm telling you, watch this. Not that I'm predicting it's going to happen, but, like, this is the year where we're like, oh, they've got five receivers, six with, like, Heath. Two Ray at seven. Some people really still like two Ray. They don't need a wide receiver. And yeah, watch this be the year he trades up and gets the wide receiver he falls in love with. Oh, yeah, yeah. Steven Smith saying, Hello, all. It's supposed to be spring, I think. In which case, gotta love the daffodils. <laughs> yeah, what daffodils? We, uh, in the state of Wisconsin, uh, at least where we've been, has been um, snowy for the last two days. So um, no daffodils here. All right, everybody, it is time for us to get going. Big Al on the way out saying random packer of the day, Dewan Harris. Uh, random packer of the day, in my mind, Brent Fullwood, since I had to quote him at the top of the show. All right, everybody, thanks so much for joining us here. Do hope uh, you had a good time. And Chloe, thanks for joining us again. I do Chloe, think she, as scheduled now, she might be coming a regular on Wednesdays again. So thanks so much for everybody for being here. And check out Friday. Friday, I'm doing free agents. And then next week, I've been asked about it a bunch. What are the thresholds? What do they look for in round one? Two-part series coming out next week. Going to cover offense and defense, going over all the details, the historical precedent, the way Gutekunst does things, going back to Ted and a little bit of Ron. Going to quote the book, going to quote other Packer content creators. That, 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 that big thing. So next week, two-part series. So do hope you check that out Friday. Free agents first, though. So thanks, everybody, for joining us. Do hope you're having a great day. And as always, go Pack Go. Pack go.